yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. We can hear you also. You have very good connection. I just bet. Okay. Okay, then uh, I am very happy <laughs> to introduce uh, Professor Alexio Martini from University of Birmingham uh, with his talk, uh, Spectral Multipliers uh, for Spherical Grushing Operators. So, uh, Professor Martini, please uh, start. Thank you very much. And thank you for your kind invitation. It's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk in this conference and to tell you something about uh, some of my work. What I'm going to talk about today is joint work with Valentina Casarino and Paolo Chatti from the University of Padova. And it's about uh, studying or trying to understand how to obtain sharp spectral multiplier theorems uh, uh, for certain Grushin type operators on the sphere. Before entering into the details of the spherical Grushin operators I'm going to talk about today, let me just recall briefly what I mean by the general problem of uh, spectral multiplier theorems. So this can be set up in a very general context, say a measure space X. Uh, you take a self adjoint operator on L2 of this measure space. We know by the spectral theorem, such a, an operator admits a spectral uh, uh, resolution. So we can write it as an integral of uh, the identity function with respect to a projection valued measure E. And by means of spectral integration, we have a functional calculus so that for every Borel function f from R to C, we have an operator f of L defined like this. And we know that uh, uh, such an operator f of L is bounded on L2 if and only if the function f, which in this context we call spectral multiplier, is an E essentially bounded function. So we have a cl quite clear and simple criterion in this context, boundedness of the multiplier corresponds to boundedness of the corresponding operator. Uh, the problem I'm interested in studying is what happens if we replace L2 with some uh, other function space on uh, X, for example, LP for P different from two. And as it happens in this case, uh, the characterizing or even finding non-trivial sufficient conditions for the boundedness of an operator of the form f of l in terms of properties of the spectral multiplier f is a much more complicated question in general. And uh, there are a number of studies of this kind, especially uh, when l is uh, a differential operator such as the Laplace uh, operator on Rd or some generalizations thereof. The reason is that uh, uh, one can use the functional calculus to actually express solutions to partial certain partial differential equations associated with, say, the Laplacian or some other operator, and therefore studying LP boundedness properties of these uh, operators actually then allows one to gain some information on the regularity uh, theory of these solutions. And in the case of the Laplacian on AD, as it happens, uh, boundedness on only a boundedness of the, of the function f is not enough to gain LP boundedness for p different from two of the corresponding operator. But as soon as we get some smoothness, as it was mentioned in previous talks, of this uh, uh, multiplier f, then we can get gain also LP boundedness for p different from two and some bounds on the derivatives, not just the, the original function f. In the case of the Laplacian, this is very classical and somehow this relation between smoothness and boundedness on other empty spaces can be seen in quite simple ways. One knows uh, very well that the, Laplace, the functions of the Laplace operator are convolution operator uh, translation invariant and the uh, convolution can is just given by the inverse Fourier transform of the multiplier composed with the square Euclidean norm, which is just a symbol of the Laplacian. So, whenever we take, say, a compactly supported function f, which is in some subvolate space, say, an L2 subvolate space of order s, then uh, if you compose it with the square Euclidean node, this doesn't change the order of regularity. Uh, so now if we take uh, the inverse Fourier transform, what happens is that uh, we observe that the convolution kernel will be in some weighted L2 space where the degree of the weight S corresponds to the order of differentiability, in particular if this degree is sufficiently large, larger than actually the half the dimension of the environment space, we have integrability of the convolution kernel and the boundedness on all LP spaces. This is a very simple and classical observation. Uh, by the way, one cannot replace D over 2 by any smaller number in this 
kind of argument is seems to be kind of a critical order of differentiability for this problem. The argument as it is written essentially applies to compactly supported functions. If you want to apply to more general kinds of functions, there are many different approaches one can apply. One way is to decompose the function dyadically, apply this kind of estimate to each compactly supported piece, and then put everything together by using the, uh, the, the calderon sigmund theory of singular integral operators. And the result is what is known as a corollary of the classical Miklinger Mandel theorem for Fourier multipliers on ID that tells us that a function of the plus operator is a weak type 1-1 one, one and bounded on LP for P strictly between 1 and infinity whenever the uh, multiplier F satisfies a local scale invariant solid condition, the so-called Miklinger Mandel type condition, if you wish, of order S greater than half the dimension D over 2. So again, this condition here d over 2 is sharp you cannot replace this number by a smaller one and hope that this still holds true as it is written uh, and uh, well this is one of the classical results in the areas and one may ask what about extensions generalizations to other settings so obviously we are not only interested in studying pds on our d or for, comp uh, for constant coefficient operators that we have seen also in other talks uh, and uh, therefore Actually, it is also interesting to analyze what happens on uh, variable coefficient operators, on operators on manifolds. So let me just restate what I've just uh, written down in a slightly different form. So here is a kind of abstract Miklinger Mandel type theorem for an operator L uh, on a space, uh, metric space X, if you wish, with a general Miklinger Mandel type as smoothness condition expressed in terms of an LQ, so we'll have norm of order S greater than some regularity threshold sigma. And what I just said means that when X is RD and L is the Laplacian, you can take small Q equals two and sigma equals D over two. Now the Laplace operator is a local model for more general second order elliptic operators on manifold. Think of the Laplace Petrani operator on an Riemannian manifold. And what it happens is that uh, what happens is that uh, the, 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 the same result essentially holds locally on manifolds too. For example, on compact manifolds where we don't have troubles with the geometry at infinity in a way, then uh, there is a, a result you have Seger and Sog that actually allows one to recover the same kind of theorem, Miklinger-Mandel theorem, exactly with the same indices. Uh, so type of solid normal order of differentiability when now D is the dimension uh, of the manifold. Now, the way of proving this result is a much more involved. Uh, you, it's not enough uh, to, to use the Fourier transform as before when using so the differential Fourier integral operator techniques, but the result is the same. And uh, I would like to point out that this D over two is actually a sharp index in the sense that actually on more gen even more general manifolds, if you had uh, an elliptic second order operator, the validity of a miklinger mandel type theorem in that context would imply, by some transplantation or contraction technique, uh, the same result for the local model operator on RD, where you take the principal part in certain coordinates. Uh, so you take, uh, say, you freeze the coefficient and take the principal part. And in the case of a second order elliptic operator, this would be just the Laplacian. So if you know that D over two is sharp for the Laplacian, you cannot do anything better on a manifold of dimension D for elliptic operators at least. Now, this is a result for compact manifolds. There are actually further extensions and generalization, although not always of the same level of sharpness. There is a very general result, which I would say in this generality is essentially due to Hebisch, though it has been uh, reproved in different methods by John Baba and Shikora, uh, which uh, is in the context of a doubling metric measure space with an operator L, which this generality may not be even a differential operator, which is assumed to satisfy Gaussian type in kernel bounds. And under just these assumptions, one can indeed obtain a miklinger mandel type theorem where the regularity threshold is half this homogeneous dimension, the dimension, this dimensional quantity capital Q, which appears in the doubling condition. Now, well, already in the talk by Alan Shikora, we have seen that doubling is not the only possible assumption, but this result, uh, as it is uh, written, is already quite general, I would say. For example, 
in a sense recovers the previous results I mentioned about RN or D and compact manifolds in the sense that these assumptions of doubling and uh, kernel estimates are satisfied and in that case Q is equal to D. So you recover essentially the same result except for this kind of small detail which is the type of solvent norm because the L infinity solvent norm result is not as sharp as the previous one but if you sort of forget about this which is not completely right anyway as far as the uh, the, the order of differentiability you get essentially the sharp order uh, what uh, is interesting however is that these kinds of assumptions uh, are actually satisfied in a much greater generality and uh, for example they are satisfied also for operators which do not satisfy elliptic in the strong form they might just be hyperliptic, satisfy some sub-elliptic estimates. I'm thinking of Hermandes, some of squares operators, sub laplacians some sub-Riemannian manifolds, even higher order operators such as Rockland operators that were mentioned in the talk by Professor Hedfer. Uh, the interesting feature, so this result would apply, again, provided the doubling condition holds, uh, but uh, the, the, the feature here is that when you have a non-elliptic operator, what happens is generally that this homogeneous dimension is strictly larger than the topological dimension. And now here things become much more involved in terms of what actually the sharp result should be and the sharp order of smoothness should be. And uh, this is actually a widely open question, I would say, in this context of non-elliptic, hyperliptic operator, if there is a sort of a result of the same kind of generality that we see, for example, a Segal and Sol kind of result, uh, which is robust enough to consider any possible operator, despite the boundedness of some geometry, in this case, or the compactness of the manifold. Anyway, one example, classical example of this sub Laplacian or sub Riemannian manifold, which has also been mentioned previously in the various talks, is that of the homogeneous sub Laplacian on stratified graded uh, Lie groups uh, or Carnot groups, and for which actually there exists a predecessor to this result by Hebisch, uh, which is uh, due to Maucheri and Mede and Christ. Uh, and since thanks to some additional symmetries and homogeneity, actually in that case, one can actually recover this type of solid normal Q being equal to two. Now, as I said, this is a wide uh, kind of area where Somehow we don't have re results which are robust as um, somehow the, the results we have seen here by Seger and Sog. And so a number of results have been obtained in the last 20, 30 years trying to improve this kind of general results in specific particular cases with different features. And what I would like to do today, instead of recalling all the possible results, is to focus on a specific example, perhaps one of the simplest example in a sense but still with a number of interesting features. It's simple at least from the point of view of dimension because I focus mainly on a two-dimensional example so perhaps the smallest possible dimension where these things can be interesting. I work on the unit sphere on R3. Obviously on the sphere we do have the standard rotation invariant Laplace Beltrami operator uh, which is elliptic so again so this result applies and this has then the local model being just a standard Euclidean Laplacian on the plate. We know that uh, the elliptic Laplacian uh, can be written as the sum of squares of three vector fields in this case, which are just the generators of rotation around the coordinate axis, Z1, Z2, Z3. And uh, these uh, vector fields do satisfy the commutation relation of the Lie algebra of SO3. So in particular, if you take two of these vector fields, their Lie bracket gives the third one which is perhaps an interesting observation from the point of view of Hermandes sum of squares operators because actually what could be considered just a sum of square of two of them. And what you obtain is some operator which is no longer uniformly elliptic, but still, I mean, the two vector fields together with their Lie bracket do span the tangent space at every point. So Hermandes results apply and the number of hyperliptic, uh, sub-elliptic estimates actually can be verified in this context. So by the way, this operator actually turns out to be elliptic away from a certain singular set, which is a one-dimensional equator where the two vector fields at one and the two become parallel. Uh, so away from the singular set, actually the local model for this operator would be uh, the standard Laplacian on the plane, but 
on the singularity, and this can be is more easily seen if you write down the operator in local coordinates uh, with these angles theta and phi, and then just forget about the second, the first order term. The local model on the singularity is what is more classically known as a Grushin operator on the plane. So dx squared plus x squared dy squared, where it's quite of evident is, is an operator which is elliptic away when from, from x equals zero, but there is this kind of degeneration of the equation. Now, there might be a number of ways to study this uh, operator that has been studied from different points of view. Now, here we are more interested in this spectrum multiplier theorem problems. Uh, but one thing that has been mentioned also in previous talks is this uh, Rothschild Stein uh, lifting technique or ways of actually analyzing these uh, operators by looking at, the, for example, the Lie algebra that is generated by these vector p's dx and x dy. And in this particular case, uh, the Lie algebra generated by this vector p is actually isomorphic to the Heisenberg group Lie algebra. So as a matter of fact, in this particular case, one can even write the Grushin plane in a way as a quotient of the Heisenberg group, the three-dimensional Heisenberg group, and in this quotient, the uh, Grushin operator corresponds to the standard homogeneous sub Laplacian x squared plus y squared on the Heisenberg group. So uh, what happens here, this is an example of, uh, an, uh, of a homogeneous sub Laplacian on, on a stratified group. Uh, so uh, Nauceri and Meda and Chris's result would apply, giving you uh, Hermann the type multiplier theorem with homogeneous dimension divided by two. But here came one of the main discoveries in this area was probably done first on the Heisenberg group due to Habisch and independently Miller and Stein that actually one can prove that making Hermann the type theorem on the Heisenberg group with condition half the topological dimension. So one can push down the condition to half the topological dimension and that's actually the sharp threshold in this case. So, Starting from this discovery, a number of results have then been uh, studied in trying to understand whether this kind of improvement can be obtained more generally for other classes of these uh, non-elliptic uh, uh, sub-Laplacians. And uh, what about the Grushin plane? Well, by the way, one could try and directly transfer by passing to the quotient the same result one has on the Heisenberg group, but this wouldn't work so well just because, uh, well, if you just do that, you get the same threshold uh, that you have on the Heisenberg group, so three over two, but now the dimension of the plane is, the uh, Grushin plane is two, so that wouldn't give you actually the sharp result. You probably need to work directly on the Grushin plane. There were other attempts to uh, try and understand this problem. There was a result by Joe Saruk Sanjay and Tangavelu, for example, but that also didn't seem to give the uh, sharp threshold. And finally, we managed with Adam Shikora by working directly on the Grushin plane uh, to obtain a sharp multiplier theorem with half the topological dimension. And actually, our result also consider higher dimensional situations as well. Uh, so now, going back to the Grushin sphere, well, this should seem at least kind of uh, encouraging that we do have some uh, results uh, for both the local model away from the singularity and on the singularity. In both cases, we know we can get this kind of sharp multiplier theorem with half the topological dimension. So it would seem likely we can actually do something on the Grushin sphere as well. But, uh, well, as a matter of fact, as far as direct implications are concerned, it doesn't work like that. I mean, you don't have a, an immediate implication here. If, if anything, it would be the other way around. If you could prove a result on the Grushin sphere, this would imply by contraction the other two results. But here one needs to work more directly on the Grushin sphere. And uh, other, somehow the, one of the complications that arises when studying the Grushin sphere is actually that the compactness of the sphere, so the lack, for example, of uh, some uh, scale invariance due to some system of dilation, the fact that the spectrum is discrete, creates a number of complications in the study of this example. An interesting observation perhaps is that uh, uh, a similar compact manifold um, example was already studied previously. Actually, there were several results of this kind, especially on SU2 and more general complex spheres. Uh, the result by Kowling and Shikora on SU2, which by the way, again, by contraction implies that of the Heisenberg group, uh, was an example showing that also on compact manifold with discrete spectrum, one can do 
uh, something and really obtain this improvement in this uh, multiply appearance. But still here on the SU2 case, you do have a translation invariance. Of the, it is a still a left invariance of Laplace, whereby on the Grushin sphere, you combine on the one side this non-translation invariance of the operator and the compactness of the manifold, so the discrete and the spectral. So in a sense, this Grushin sphere result, while it, it is very kind of connected to many other existing examples, on the other side, doesn't seem, uh, sort of seems to collect a number of the issues and problems that one may May, may, may find another problem. So that's what we were going to study. And uh, well, let me just uh, summarize. We work on the unit sphere with the rotation invariant measure. We take the generator of rotation uh, vector fields, Z1, Z2, Z3. We just take two of them and form the sum of square for the spherical Grushin operator, which is sub elliptic and elliptic of the equator. Uh, we know that we have a subriemannian structure and the Carnot-Carnot distance associated with that, for which we have Gaussian type canal bound. So the Hebisch result uh, would apply, giving us a condition with half the homogeneous dimension, which would be three in this case. But what we could prove in collaboration with Valentino Casarino and Paolo Chatti is that actually we can improve on this result and uh, obtain a, a theorem which is, uh, has half the topological dimension as in room the, uh, derivatives as, uh, and uh, L2 sublet condition instead of L infinity. This result is sharp. It, somehow the fact that, as I said before, it implies the results on the plane and the Grushin plane, and these are sharp. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, the same proof also uh, includes uh, L1 boundedness results for the associated Bock Nevitz means. This is a result as it is stated now just for this particular Grushin operator on the 2D sphere. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we uh, went on uh, with this study and we managed to show that actually similar results can be obtained also in higher dimension and the higher dimensional situation is perhaps more interesting also because one can also vary the dimension of the singular set, the kind of equator that you choose in the higher dimensional spheres, but I don't have the time I think for this conference, I'd prefer to stick to the simplest example of the 2D sphere. So in the remaining time, I'd like to tell you some uh, uh, ideas uh, from the proof. The uh, main thing here is really to try and exploit the symmetries that we have at our disposal in order to obtain some information on the spectral decomposition for this operator. And uh, an interesting observation perhaps is the fact that this operator uh, Z1 squared plus Z2 squared commutes with the third missing field uh, Z3. Uh, and uh, in part so if you want, instead of using Z3, you take I Z3 to have a self-adjoint operator, but it's called this T. So this Grushin operator commutes with T. And uh, this L plus T squared is actually the sum of the three vector fields, so is actually the Laplace Beltrami operator. So what is interesting is that actually the spectral of the composition of this spherical Grushin operator is nothing is can can be written as the uh, in terms of the joint spectral of the composition of the Laplace Beltrami and uh, this uh, uh, vector field T. But this is nothing else than the classical decomposition into spherical harmonics. It is very well studied, and uh, so you usually have this uh, notation y l m, where l is a non-negative integer, m is an integer going from minus l to l. You know what the eigenvalue for the Laplace Beltrami is l, l plus one, and m would be the eigenvalue for t. So the difference would give you exactly the eigenvalue for the Grushin operator. And using the spectral decomposition, we can then write down more general functions for the Laplace operator of the Grushin operator, and then at the corresponding integral kernel and then L2 norms in one variable of those kernels. So, as it turns out, uh, many of the problems we have here boil down to finding suitable estimates for the spherical harmonic functions here, which are suitably uniform in L and L. And now, uh, interestingly enough, I mean, obviously, these are very well studied functions. Uh, on the other hand, at least uh, looking at the literature, I mean, it's vast, so we may have missed something, but we couldn't find out of the box the estimates we really needed in order to solve this problem. So we really needed to combine a number of results available in the literature. Let me just tell you something uh, very, if 
perhaps uh, general about the spherical harmonic function is well known. We can write them as this phase component, which we, doesn't matter much for our computation, which because we are more interested in the absolute value of this. And then what are known as associated Legendre function, you can write it also in terms of um, again Bauer polynomials and so on. So we have this kind of uh, two indices, L integer, and non-negative integer, and this M going from minus L to L. And we have a really a various different cases that one would have to consider in general the zonal harmonics where m is equal to zero, which tend to concentrate on the poles, the highest weight harmonics where model m is equal to l, which instead tend to concentrate along the equator. And these kind of different concentrations actually are somewhat relevant also to our, our operator, which has a different behavior, elliptic or non-elliptic, on the poles or on the, on the equator. But uh, uh, as a matter of fact, our problem is that we need estimates which are uniform and, uh, are, um, around um, sort of on the, along the, the whole range of indices. Uh, it is somewhat known that if you just look at the profile given by the associated Legendre function that you would have this kind of oscillating uh, profile for this uh, uh, spherical harmonics in this Z or uh, vertical coordinate. This oscillation terminates at a certain point, some so-called transition point, after which you have a fast decay, uh, at least if you are not in the zonal case. And there are a number of uniform estimates available in the literature telling you how much the infinity norm of these uh, functions can be, or even if you dump this uh, by putting some weight that vanishes at the poles or at the equator. But these estimates were useful to not, are not enough for us. We need some more precise information, especially on where the peak is reached and what is the behavior around this kind of peak that we get. And uh, for this, we need some more explicit representation or um, sort of uh, asymptotic or approximation in terms of Hermit function and Bessel functions. And we were kind of lucky to find actually worked out very explicit expression for a sort of um, associated legend functions or spherical harmonics in terms of either uh, Hermit functions or Bessel function via a certain change of variable and uh, up to a certain error term, which in the result by Over and Boyd and Dunster was also given with uh, suitable bounds. And this was enough for us to actually uh, sort of cook up uh, this set of estimates, which depend on the regime we are in terms of the indices. So if M is larger or comparable with L, or M is much smaller than L, so the sort of Hermit regime or the Bessel regime. And in, in, in each of these ranges, we have this kind of estimate which tell us something more about what happens at uh, the, the transition point in this kind of peaks. And by using these estimates, we are finally able to gain uh, some uh, more precise information on this operator. Let me just very briefly tell you how we apply these estimates. So the idea is that we have this kind of expression for the uh, integral kernel. So as a sum of linear combination of spherical harmonics, it's natural to analyze this expression to split the sum according to the value of the, eigen, the eigenvalue of the Grushin operator. Actually, it's a uh, standard to consider the square root of this and then take intervals of length one. And uh, so this splits the sort of lattice of indices L and M into this kind of hyperbolic regions. Uh, we have a further splitting due to the two cases, the Hermit or the Bessel regime. And for each of these uh, kind of regions, we can get some good estimates. So in the kind of Bessel part, we obtain this estimate for the sum of squares of the spherical harmonics, which can be interpreted as some sort of L1, L2 uh, projection, as so estimate for a for an orthogonal projection, which is really the standard specular cluster estimate you would have for an elliptic operator here. So here you have this power i, which is the size of the eigen or square root of the eigenvalue, which in the standard estimate would be so i to the dimension of the manifold minus one. In this case, the dimension is two, so it's correct to have the one. So that's perfectly fine. The, uh, somehow, what we can see that the operator is not elliptic on the other region, the Hermit region, where you do get this additional factor. And in this additional factor, you have 
actually either i to the power two, if you forget about this x to the minus one, so you get an additional dimension, which is the, what you don't want because you don't want the homogeneous dimension, you want the topological dimension. Or you can get i to the power one, but then you may have to take this factor x to the minus one, which kind of diverges when x goes to zero, that is on the singularity. So this really represents what's going on here. It's elliptic, but it's not uniformly elliptic in a sense. And uh, how do we deal with this non-ellipticity? Well, what happens is that actually one can kind of dump down this, 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 this additional factor by using a suitable weighted spectral cluster estimate by adding this kind of coefficient. And what are these coefficients? They are just a ratio of, of powers of the eigenvalue of the Grushin operator and the eigenvalue of T. And what is nice is that at the same time, we also have a some sort of, say, sub-elliptic estimate or a Ritz time transform estimate telling us that actually, since the sub, so here the Grushin operator is a sum of squares operator, it actually dominates in L2 norm each of the summons. So you get such a weighted L2 estimate where on the right hand side, this ratio of operators exactly appears. So if you combine all these estimates together at the end, you get what is sometimes called a weighted Planchard type estimate, where on the left hand side you have a weighted L2 norm of the integral kernel in one variable but as you see there is this kind of weight that you can get up to a certain degree one and on the right hand side that is the crucial thing you do have an expression depending on f but doesn't depend on derivatives on f so you are not paying any derivative on f and you are gaining sort of for free some weight up to a certain degree and this gain is exactly what is crucial in order to then gain on the general multiplier theorem. So now I won't have the time to enter into the details, but this other part is somewhat more classical and is also an adaptation of uh, works that have been done previously also by Kaolin and Shikora and others uh, in order to deal with this uh, situation with compact manifolds. But in any case, uh, it's just to mention that at the end, by combining this, this is the crucial element that combined with the general argument by Hepish and some other technicalities gives you finally the sharp result with half the topological dimension. So yes, at least we managed to obtain a kind of complete the, 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 the picture here, obtain this additional result with the sharp multiplier theorem also in the Grushin sphere. As I said, there are a number of open problems apart from clearly investigating the higher dimensional case the most interesting problem, I think, in this area is really to understand whether there are more robust techniques that apply that don't rely so much on symmetries, but this would require uh, other kinds of investigations and ideas, I think. So, yes, I think I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, Professor Martini, thank you very much. for This is very interesting question, uh, very interesting talk, sorry. Uh, we are open for questions then. Any question? Yes, may I ask one? Please. Please. So thank you very much, Alessio. This was uh, really fascinating. Um, so in the in this uh, higher dimensional case, there was a parameter k. Where, yeah. where did I didn't I couldn't really Let see what it was. Where does this come from? Yes, it was very quick. Yeah, this one. Yes, that's right. So the idea is that uh, if you have a higher dimensional sphere, you have uh, uh, obviously sub spheres, if you wish, or great circles could actually, whatever that means, uh, can be of uh, different dimensions. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I mean, what you can do here to construct this kind of Grushin type operators is just to think that, you know, the on the sphere, you have the action of the group S, uh, SOD plus one in this case, okay? And you could essentially take uh, the, not only the sum of squares of, uh, the, 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 of, of all the possible kind of generators of rotations at JR, but you can take the sum of square just up to a certain dimension, which would essentially be, at least when you restrict it to a smaller dimensional sphere, you would get the Laplace Beltrami on the smaller sphere mm -hmm. or something like that. But obviously this is defined on the whole space and in particular on the whole sphere, not just on the subsphere. So these are naturally defined operator that come, if you wish, you can um, sort of uh, 
use uh, the representation of itself to define. So could think of SOD plus one containing SOD, SOD minus one, and each of them has a Casimir operator, if you wish, mm -hmm. and then you can just uh, use all of them. And they do commute, I mean, uh, pairwise. Mm -hmm. In a sense, so that's why you can then form the difference of, say, this kind of Laplace Beltrami on the whole sphere minus this Laplace Beltrami on the smaller sphere. And each of these actually are some of squares operators satisfying Hernandez condition. So mm -hmm. uh, this uh, produces this kind of set of uh, Grushin type operators, which have good symmetry properties, and therefore you can apply analogous hyperspherical harmonic decomposition, if you wish to, to actually study, though things become technically a bit more involved. So, okay, thank you. So, but what I didn't understand now is, so for each fixed K, you study these operators or are these operators tools to study? I so we know. study, yes, for each, uh, if you wish, for each fixed D and K, yes, for each dimension and each uh, sort of dimension of the singularity we have, uh, uh, we, we can study the, 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 the corresponding operator. I mean, I, I don't uh, exclude in principle, one could try and, and study more generally the joint functional calculus of the, all these operators, but we were focusing on each single example, trying to understand what happens. And at least this is perhaps another tricky observation is the fact that actually we managed to get what we know to be the sharp result only when the, the singularity has dimension at most half the dimension of the whole manifold. This is actually a phenomenon that we have already seen in the work with Adam Shikora previously, because also in our work on the plane or the flat uh, kind of a lip, uh, or Grushin operator on RN, say, we did have a similar issue in the sense that we didn't manage to get a sharp result with after topological dimension when the dimension of the sort of second factor was bigger than the dimension of the first. So again, we had a similar kind of problem we managed to overcome this uh, in collaboration with Detlef Müller. Then we have a different approach to sharp multiplier theorems that actually allows one to get uh, the sharp result in that case. But that to implement that also in the context of spheres, I mean, it's probably possible, but may require even further work and ideas. Okay, well. Do you expect this that. going to be true? I mean, do you expect to, uh, that, that it's possible to, to get rid of 2K from the estimates? Or? I expect so, yes. I do expect so. I have some preliminary computation that seem to indicate this should be possible. I mean, by the way, it's actually very annoying in the sense, I think, because isn't it uh, the, uh, the simplest possible example, perhaps, is really delta D minus delta D minus 1. And D minus 1, so if K is D minus 1, is normally much bigger than, than 2 D over 2. So, so yes, uh, one would really think that on the one side, this would be a kind of a simple example to study because uh, somehow the spectral representation would seem to be more easy. But on the other hand, then uh, how to actually get down to the result seems to really require some additional uh, work and ideas. And I do think really in that case, uh, this kind of discussion whether if you should use weights on the first layer and the second layer. In this case, the second layer seems to actually be the only possible way to get the result, but still seems to to really require some 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 some, some additional hard work and uh, and then then I mean with the, all the complexities of the fact that uh, while on the say Grushin uh, flat Grushin case you would have still this kind of homogeneity that in a way helps. Here, everything is discrete. And so you really have to reconstruct perhaps a differentiation structure starting from finite order uh, differences and things like that. And this really becomes a, a kind of huge, huge problem, at least technically. That's why, I mean, I would be very happy if there was some more robust and general methods instead of continuously going through properties of eigenfunction expansions. But on the other hand, uh, yes, I, I would think that the result is actually uh, true without the 2K. And as I said, some preliminary computations seem to indicate the possibility of doing that, but, 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 but it's, it's not so clear to me at the moment uh, how to get to the end of it, at least. <laughs> okay. Um, any other question? Uh, Alessio. Yes. Rahul here. Very Hello. good talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
so i i have a, a very small question very basic question so uh, this gaussian type heat kernel bounds yes and the finite propagation speed on the sphere yes so are these uh, facts from the general theory i know very little on it or is yes. it for the gaussian sphere i'm yes. talking yes 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 i think uh, for example i think i mean uh, uh, there is a very uh, i mean the, the, there are various kinds of approaches one can apply but i mean the finite propagation speed uh, in itself uh, is uh, uh, is a very well known uh, kind of fact for this kind of uh, sum of squares operators and uh, well okay there are many many different uh, references i mean i would say probably meros is one of the classical references for non elliptic operators and so on uh, then okay. uh, the fact is that as soon as you have that plus set an additional on diagonal bounds, uh, then you can apply, for example, the argument by Adam Shikora that gives you from finite propagation speed allows you to get to, to gain this uh, Gaussian type of kernel bounds. So okay. I think that for the kind of plain Grushin operators, oper Grushin operators on, R on RD, also with much more general L infinity coefficient that there is this paper by Robinson and Shikora that actually yes. describes quite in detail how to also obtain the on diagonal bounds and so on. Uh, okay. In the case of the Grushin sphere specifically, you could do things very much by hand for the on diagonal bound because you have the representation theory and you can make some small computation and gain that right. as well. But, but I would say that there are, I mean, for example, I think that the paper by Robinson and Shikora is a good reference also to explore the literature and see techniques by Davies, yes, so for example. I'm aware of Yes, so I am aware of paper of Robinson and Sikora, and as I understand, so one can uh, sort of understand that theory and can perhaps apply directly to also check directly these uh, estimates for the sphere as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say Is that, that what you're saying. Uh, yeah, and saying the similar techniques would apply uh, here as well, uh, and that right. uh, that the compactness of the sphere should make some of the problems even easier in a sense. Whereas the local, okay, uh, I mean, problem should be, uh, is, it can be more dealt with with these these other additional techniques. Yes. Fine, fine. Thank you, Alessio. No worries. Okay. Uh, more question? Um, is it possible to do these uh, in the case of other rank one compact symmetric spaces? Because instead of using the, I mean, you can use the Jacobi. Uh, uh, polynomials. I understand that you, you estimates on the zonal function, uh, spherical function is not enough. You need also the full eigen uh, functions. Yeah. But in the in the case of other, uh, you know, like complex projective spaces and so on, is it possible to do a similar kind of analysis? I mean, I expect so, but again, uh, each each case at least would seem to require slightly different techniques. But I do expect possibilities are there. I mean, let me just mention that. Uh, I mean, now I, I worked, uh, discussed today the problem for Grushin operators. Actually, there is a previous result by Cowling and Shikora on the complex sphere, which is now not a Grushin type operator, but it is a, a translation invariant uh, sub Laplacian. And actually, Cowling, Klim, and Shikora also obtained uh, a reasonable, an analogous result on higher dimensional complex spheres in which these are not groups, but the operator is still invariant under the action of uh, SUN. So, and uh, then you can extend this also to forms uh, associated to the, to the cauchy riemann complex. And then we also have some results in that context uh, using, again, heavily representation theory methods. So it's just to say that I do expect that uh, many other examples might be constructed in this uh, set up definitely so I I, 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 it does seem to be possible in many different cases as soon as you gain the right understanding of the eigenfunction expansions involved to, 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 to get to this kind of results. Uh, the Grushin sphere in a sense was perhaps nice to, to look at because it's really the smallest possible dimensional example and so somewhat uh, in principle, simple, but already contains apparently a certain amount of complexity. Uh, obviously, I, I definitely I would expect uh, possibilities to be there to, 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 to consider more general situations and, uh, and examples. And I would say, yes, this compact symmetric space case seem to be a possibility of generating further example. We don't have 
results of from quaternionic spheres, for example. So just to say, uh, yes, it, it's, it's, it's definitely possible to, 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 to work on that as well. Thank okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Martini, for your talk. Very interesting. So we will stop uh, sharing. Uh, we will have a lunch break. Uh, we will return to our conference at 2 p.m. Um, David had maybe half a... No, there is nothing I have to add. So please... Uh... Okay, then see you at 2 p.m.